Welcome to the Interlocked Bible Study. We're on Lesson 21 in the second part, and we're going through the kingdom age of Israel. We began with creation. We went through the fall, the flood, Tower of Babel, Abraham, Exodus, the law, the conquest, and now we've hit the kingdom. And the focal point here is on the uh, the kingdom of uh, Israel, and we're going to see God's interaction between Israel, whom he called his son, and himself, and now with the relationship of kings and kingdoms. We're going to see, as we get this insider's perspective on Israel, how God, what God's attitude is toward people's hearts, people's attitudes, and their responses, how uh, leadership is important to mankind, followership, having someone that they can look toward that's physical and human. And they look at that person and say, he or she is a model. I, I will pattern my life after him or her. I will... Um, not take responsibility, personal responsibility for my decisions. I, I will just follow what uh, this person is telling me what to do. He or she is very wise. And so I need that kind of input. And we, we today have people we call mentors. We have coaches, uh, we have leaders, and we have all kinds of different <clears throat> accountability um, individuals and, and systems in place so that we can make proper decisions. This is in the financial world. This is in the personal world, uh, in marriage and raising children in, in business, you name it. Um, people have a coach for everything. And so mankind is always looking for a human figure to say, give me instruction, give me, uh, just feed me, tell me what to do. And, and, and I'll just follow that. And those, these will be the five steps of success according to what you're saying. They've worked in the past, they'll work again. <clears throat> I just have to follow them. So we see this human tendency. So God God was Israel's king, but he was an invisible king. He, uh, he was invisible in that he's a spiritual God ruling from heaven. And yet God did manifest himself in, in, in a practical and visible way to the Israelite people, which is uh, a, a unique um, circumstance. It's, it's a unique opportunity for Israel to say, wow, yeah, no, this invisible almighty God and creator of the universe is actually lives among us. He is, he resides, his presence, the, the glory of God, the Shekinah, shining, visible glory of God resides in this tabernacle that sits among us, among our people. And the people of the, the Levites, they attend to the uh, mediation between us and God. And, and so there was all these visible reminders they had, but that was not enough for them. They said, we want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. Okay, That phrase reflects their heart. We want to be like the people and nations around us. So their, their heart is, is rejecting God as their king, as their ruler. Did they have written scrolls at the time? Yes, uh, uh, Moses had left them with texts that they could use and follow and read and listen to. And, and have direct responsibility as individuals before God and making decisions. But, but they pursued a, a physical ruler with this uh, crown on his head and this majestic uh, um, rulership with princes and princesses, with uh, all that entails having kings, where when, when a king comes to visit, they sit down at the table and they discuss kingly matters. Israel just longed for that. We just, we, we, we can't stand having this, uh, everybody does that which is right in their own eyes and goes in a hundred different directions. Uh, we, we need a, uh, a unified, uh, a person to unify all of the tribes together and to rule with an iron fist. So this is, this in this period of time, we see 
Israel's heart and God, how God deals with them and reacts and responds. And we're going to learn many things about uh, God through this process and how he views us today in our own lives as Christians, as Jesus followers and his disciples. We, we are going to be able to make comparisons in this process of sanctification, which we are in today. As Jesus is molding us and making us into his likeness. But is Jesus invisible today? To us, he is. He is no longer here. He has sent his comforter in, in his place. The comforter is the Holy Spirit of God. And can you see the Holy Spirit of God? No, he, he is a spirit. But you can see the effects of the spirit as people give their life and the kingship of their own life over to the control of the spirit of God. You see the actions and attitudes of those individuals being made manifested in practical ways as you interact with them and have a relationship with them. You, it's easy to tell, uh, for the most part, who is and who is not walking in obedience to the Holy Spirit and under his control and guidance, and who is not. It's, uh, there's, there's, there are ways of seeing, identifying people who are humble and meek and walk in obedience to the Lord. But we too struggle sometimes with, with seeking a model, wanting to have that person and follow him or her, uh, follow his or her teachings and, and to do what he or she does. And we can, we can list all kinds of people in this modern age who are TV personalities, or they are well-known throughout the world or throughout uh, the United States or in our own state that we live in, et cetera. There's, there, we identify people we would love to be like. And okay, there's some great models out there, but it does not diminish our personal responsibility. It does not diminish our personal responsibility to make decisions every day, to walk in his way, to be obedient to his word, to have a heart that reflects the heart of God, to have a heart that, that yearns for him and is passionate about him and to make him known and glorified in and through our lives, and to pursue a relationship with him. Nothing else can replace that, that personal responsibility. All right, so let's go through some of these aspects of, of the kingdom and the kingship and, and what took place. So the first king, his name is Saul, and Saul was someone who God chose. God anointed him. So we're going to be looking in 1 Samuel chapters 9 to 15. So this account covers a significant amount of texts. And, and this is where the king was anointed and God chose Samuel to take on that responsibility of pouring oil over his uh, head as a symbol of his anointing, being chosen by God to take leadership over God's people. But God left conditions, as we talked about in our former session, God left conditions that this king was not uh, without accountability. He was not a loose cannon, not like the Gentile nations where his word was absolute. No, this king, he was in subjection. He himself had limited authority because God is his ultimate authority. And he was to, to be responsible to God and accountable to him for all of his decisions. So whatever God's word says, that is what he was obligated and responsible to follow and to lead his own people in obedience to the king of kings and lord of lords, Yahweh. So Samuel chapter 10 verse 1 says, he took a flask of oil, olive oil, and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be ruler over Israel his special possession. So in the Bible, we see that God always has the prophet proceed or introduce a king. This is an interesting characteristic throughout the king, kingdom age of Israel. 
where there's always an, a prophet that is, is assigned by God to introduce it to a point. When and there's there are sometimes rebellion that takes place, uh, coups uh, within the kingdom of Israel, and it does not end very well for those those kings. But in in God's God's kingdom and His His system, He would send His own uh, prophet, the one who is to speak forth His word to represent Himself to confirm whom God has appointed as king. So Samuel anointed Saul, and, and then he, it, he was responsible to anoint later on David as well. We see this also in David's time, the prophet Nathan, who took over from Samuel. And, and, uh, and from there on, uh, a whole series of prophets would be involved in king making. So Nathan, as you recall, appointed Solomon as king. So this is why even in the New Testament, John the Baptist came before Jesus. John, who is the final Old Testament prophet, was Jesus's anointing prophet. Let that sink in a little bit. God promised in Isaiah that he would send uh, someone to prepare the path for the coming of the king and the kingdom of God. And John preached the kingdom of God. Jesus, upon his arrival, presented the kingdom of God to the people of Israel, which, as you recall, uh, in, 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 and we'll study this in more detail in the future, they, Israel rejected their God king, their uh, Jehovah as their king, King Jesus. They rejected him. But John's responsibility as a prophet was to prepare the way and anoint him. We saw that happening through the baptism of John. Jesus told John, it must be so. This has to happen. It, baptism is not an option. John said, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, this must be fulfilled uh, in this way. So let's, let's see what happens as Samuel then takes it on uh, his responsibility to transfer his leadership, to transfer his former authority as a judge. Samuel, as you recall, was the final judge of Israel. And the time of the judges would come to an abrupt end. As Israel requests the king, God appoints the king, and now Samuel is anointing the king. So there's a transfer of leadership. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 12. So Samuel begins a speech to the people uh, asking for evidence of whether he did a good job or whether he had been a wicked prophet. And the people agreed that he indeed had been a good prophet. Let's read through 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 1 to 5. Then Samuel addressed all Israel, I have done as you asked and given you a king. Your king is now your leader. I stand here before you, an old gray-haired man, and my sons serve you. I have served you as, our, as your leader for, from the time I was a boy to this very day. Now, I, now testify against me in the presence of the Lord and before the, his anointed one, Whose ox or donkey have I stolen? Have I ever cheated any of you? Have I ever oppressed you? Have I ever taken a bribe or perverted justice? Tell me, and I will make whatever I have done wrong. I will make right whatever I've done wrong. No, they replied, you have never cheated or oppressed us. And you have never taken even a single bribe. The Lord and his anointed one are my witnesses today, Samuel declared, that my hands are clean. He is a witness, they replied. So Samuel's confirming, yes, I was a good, good leader to you. So we're not talking about this transfer of leadership to try to escape injustice at my hand. No, this is happening because you requested a king. Okay, so we're going to see that this kingship is a conditional kingship. If you obey, if the people obey, if the king obeys, 
then there'll be blessing. If the people rebel, then there's going to be cursing. There's going to be frustration. It's much, very similar to the Sinaitic or Mosaic covenant that was given when the law was given. If you obey my word, there will be blessing. If not, however, if you turn to idols, you're going to have a very, very frustrating life, very tough life as you live in disobedience and you'll, you'll find yourself in hot water, difficult circumstances as you reap the consequences of your decisions. So our sanctification is so similar in this way. There's conditionality to our sanctification. So as our justification is secured by a one-time event of accepting Christ as our Savior, but as we pursue to make him Lord of our life on a day-to-day -day basis, that he become king and important, and that we follow him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, this process of sanctification is conditional. Because one day we just take that scepter out of the hand of God and we pull it back to ourselves and say, no, nope, I am king here of my life and I'm going to do what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it and, and how I'm going to do it. And there ain't nobody else who's going to tell me how to do things. So we have that tendency. We need to give that scepter back to God and his rulership and his kingdom. Take off our, our crowns and give it back to the Lord and make him Lord of our lives. So as as the this uh, sanctification has an aspect of conditionality to it. So did Israel in their relationship to their king and the king's relationship to God. So in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12 to 19, let's read through this as the story continues. But when you were afraid of Nahash, the king of Ammon, you came to me and said that you wanted a king to reign over you. So you see, it's very fear driven, even though the Lord, your God was already your king. All right, here's the king you have chosen. You asked for him and the Lord has granted your request. Now, if you fear and worship the Lord and, and listen to his voice, and if here you're seeing the conditionality of this, if your king will show that you recognize the Lord as your God, but if you rebel against the Lord's commands and you refuse to listen to him, then his hand will be as heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. First Samuel 12, 12 to 19, let's continue on with verse 16. Now stand here and see the great thing the Lord is about to do. You know that it does not rain at this time of the year during the wheat harvest, and I will ask the Lord to send thunder and rain today. Then you will realize how wicked you have been in asking the Lord for a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people were terrified of the Lord and of Samuel. Pray to the Lord your God for us, or we will die, they all said to Samuel. For now we have added to our sins by asking for a king. So Samuel's making a point here, establishing that indeed their request was out of place. They were wrong in asking for a king to replace Yahweh as their king, to listen to the human king rather than the eternal and uh, sovereign king of all of the universe, king over all the nations, had they truly understood who Yahweh was and had not forgotten, they would not be af afraid of this king Nahash, as they mentioned. They lived in fear. Here now you're seeing they're, uh, they're afraid of Samuel and they're afraid God's going to kill him. Fear is very, very prevalent among the Israelite people and it drives them to all kinds of decisions. You and I make a lot of decisions based on fear. We do. How many times have I made decisions based on fear? Today, we have uh, um, a volatile stock market in the United States, and it's also being affected all over the world. There's volatility due to inflation. And when we see our portfolios going up and down, what strikes at your heart? Often fear. Am I going to have enough for my retirement? Am I going to have enough for my children? Am I going to have enough to cover the expenses, my health bills? Am I going to have, 
fear strikes our heart because financial world, that's the way it is. There's volatility. We want to see everything going well, the blessing, this upward trend constantly. I'm just making a comparison that, that fear uh, can, can be very motivating. And we can make all kinds of decisions very quickly and emotionally all of a sudden. Instead of consulting first with God and saying, God, what would you have me do here? There's volatility in the market. What should I buy? What should I sell? Should I just uh, sit on the, the stocks that I have? Should I? I'm just giving an example of, of, the, of how fear can, can, can control our lives. But if we walk with God, we can make choices based on the wisdom that God gives, the decisions. We can ask God for, for input, his, his understanding and knowledge. And Israel could have done the same thing. But no, they said, please give us a king. Let me hire a specialist. He's going to tell me exactly what to do, when I should sell, when I should buy. I'm, I'm going to make sure someone else is managing everything. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. No, I'm just saying that this is a human tendency, that instead of trusting on God, we trust in human human beings. And again, uh, God, uh, God granted the people their request. God said, here you go. Uh, you can have a king. But by having a king, you're going to have to pay levy heavy taxes. You're going to have to pay quite a bit. You're going to pay by giving up even your own children to him as, as servants. There's going to be sacrifice involved. Um, so yes, you can have a king, but this is what, what some of the actions and consequences are going to be. So God demonstrates here to the Israelites through Samuel's request of sending rain during a dry period that he indeed is in charge of all the nature and everything. God could have led them into battle against Nahash and, and any of the other oppressors and expanded their borders to the proper uh, amount of land that God had promised them according to his covenant. They could have trusted God in that, but they, but they lived in fear. They wanted to be like those who were around them. They did not pursue a relationship with him. So our sanctification is like that. We have a lot of ups and downs where we often trust ourselves. We, we, we are motivated by fear. We wrestle with this sin nature that we have. And it's, it's, God understands our hearts, but the problem lies where we try to find a solution elsewhere. We need to go to God for solutions. We, we need to depend on him. He indeed is sovereign. He, he shows here to the people of Israel, I'm in charge of the rain. I'm in charge of uh, lightning. I'm in charge of the harvest. In a typical dry season when you should be harvesting wheat, I'm going to drench it with water. And they said, we're going to die if we, don't, if we don't trust in God. We're sorry. We have sinned. So they confess their sin. And that's appropriate. Appropriate response is to say, woe is me. Father, I have sinned against you. I, In my arrogance, in my pride, in my fear, I've made these decisions that are contrary to your word. Uh, help me in my unbelief. Help me in my fear. Help me overcome this. Give me boldness, Father. And he will. He grants that. So in Samuel chapter 12, the story continues on. Samuel says, don't be afraid. Samuel reassured them. You have certainly done wrong. So Samuel doesn't beat around the bush. Yep, you blew it. But make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart. Okay, so you ask for a king. We've got, we've got all of our human relationships. We, we got the pastor we asked for. We've got the, we've got the uh, church uh, treasurer we asked for. We've got the, the CEO we've asked for, or the financial uh, accountant that we asked for, or tax guy. All right, we got him. Now, in the midst of that decision, let's, let's return back to the Lord, okay? Even though we have a financial advisor, even though we have a, a, a new director in our organization or a, a, a new worship, uh, someone who worship, leads worship or uh, uh, whatever, financial advisor, in the midst of that decision, make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart and don't turn back your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping worthless idols that cannot help you or rescue you. They are totally useless. The Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name. For it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. Wow, 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 wow. 
how comforting that must be. It is for me. In, in, in this day and age, in the time of the church, uh, in, in, in multiple places in the New Testament, especially in Ephesians, we are called in Christ. We are children of God. We have a position in Christ Jesus, and it's as secure as Jesus is secure. Wow, and he calls us his own. And so if, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he is the righteous one. And he has imputed his righteousness in, into our own hearts and our own lives. So in our justification, we're set, but in our sanctification, it's up and down. It's, 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 it can be messy. And so we see the grace of God at work here uh, in our own lives, and we see it here uh, that it, it, it was extended to the people of Israel as well, even before the day and the, the coming of Jesus Christ and the age of the church. It says, for it pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. God wants this. God wants Israel to be successful. They are his people. For his name's sake, he's going to preserve them. Not because they deserve it, but for his name's sake. Verse 23, as for me, I will certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. Meditate on them, on them think on them, remember them. But if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. Guys, you're not exempt from falling again. Watch yourself. Continually remember what the Lord has done for you. Worship him. He is God. So let's look at the Saul's life a little bit. Our, our examination of Saul's life is going to be very brief in these lessons. Uh, our next lesson will have to do with David, and we'll go into a little more detail of the kings of Israel. But uh, this first king, he was not a good first king. He was not a successful king before the Lord. He was dishonoring and disobedient. He, he was ambitious and self-preserving. You could say he was spiritually immature. And his heart was not with God. And it showed up in his actions. I'm telling you, whatever is in your heart, it's going to find itself out. It's going to work its way out in one way or another. So in your decisions and your attitude and what you say and what you do, if you're constantly complaining, that's a good indication that there's some maintenance that needs done in your heart. If you're constantly spreading gossip, there's, there's something going on in your heart that you need to correct before the Lord. If you're constantly just trying to protect your territory, there's something going on in your heart. If you're constantly jealous of other people and what they think and what they do, look at your heart. It's not a pretty picture, but give your heart to the Lord. Say, Lord, I've got this issue. Something there's, there, I'm wrestling with this sin nature inside of me. Woe is me. Who can, who can deliver me from this? And Paul, the apostle in Romans, answers it and said, Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. So there is hope. There is hope of overcoming this, this heart that we wrestle with on a continual basis. And it's, no, it's not, nothing new. The king's, King Saul wrestled with his own heart and being distant from God and not honoring him. So some of the ways that Saul really messed it up and, 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 and demonstrated his dishonor of God is before battling the Philistines, for example. Samuel uh, was supposed to offer the burnt offerings and burnt sacrifice, but Saul became impatient. While waiting for Samuel to arrive, he dishonored and disobeyed God by sacrificing the burnt offering himself, something that only priests from the tribe of Levi were allowed to do. And then he showed how uh, his place in, in his own ambition and his own self-preservation above the needs of other people. Saul um, put his own needs over the soldiers that he fought with and their need for food. He ordered the death penalty on anyone if they ate before they won the battle. This silly vow resulted in the people breaking the Mosaic law 
and almost resulted in him executing Jonathan, his own son. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Another example of just his silliness and foolishness is he rebelled against God's instructions. Uh, God told him to wage holy war on the Amalekites. He was supposed to destroy everything, but he didn't. He didn't kill King Agag. And he kept all the best sheep, oxen, calves, and lambs instead of destroying them. That was in 1 Samuel chapter 15. So God had set up this kingship to be subject, subject to himself, to be accountable to himself, to obey God, the king of kings. The king of Israel could not do whatever he wanted to. And these prophets that God sent were to hold the king accountable for his actions. So they had limited authority. But Saul, he wanted to be like the other kings. No, one, no other king uh, in, in all the nations around me has to listen to these little prophet guys. I'm going to do whatever I want to. Why, why just because I'm the king of Israel, I have to be under authority? And that affected Saul in a big way in his attitude. So, so God rejects Saul as king as a result. But I, I sure hope we don't get to that point. I do not want to get to that point where I sin, I walk in sin, I walk in rebellion against God, and I go down this path so far that there's no turning back. God, God resigns. He sighs and says, Mike, you've You've just gone down this road too far in rebellion against me. Now I'm just letting you go. I reject you as my servant. I reject you as a shepherd of other people. I reject you as a Bible teacher. I reject you as a cross-cultural missionary. I reject you as a key component of the purposes that I want accomplished on in earth today. Wow, I don't want to be there. I don't think you do either. I don't think we want rejection by God. But here we see it. It happens. Don't, don't be like Saul. Uh, if he's a model and example to us, it's an example of how not to be, a warning to us, to not follow in the same arrogancy and, and, uh, and self-preservation and uh, where where we feel like we're the final authority over everything and we reject the authority of God. Let's not go down that road. It's not a pretty place. It doesn't take us to a, a good place. It God will then release us and and let us do whatever we want and unfortunately our sin we don't know how far it'll take us. Once you start down that path, how far will it go? We don't know. It's hard to say. I would rather be accountable to God and, and be confronted by God and be confronted by prophets that he puts around me or, or people who love God to warn me and to confront me and say, whoa, 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 where do you think you're going? That You're not going down a, a good path. Watch your decisions. Watch your heart. Um, that is the loving thing to do. I know it's not easy. No one likes confrontation, but it's necessary that we confront one another in love, uh, correct interpretation of the word of God, walking in the spirit and confront one another uh, in a proper way to re return, to repent and return back to a healthy relationship with God. So God rejects King Saul. Samuel and first Samuel, first Samuel chapter 13. He's confronting Saul. How foolish, Samuel explained. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. you ha had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Wow. Forever is a very long time. That has the implications that the Messiah would have come through the lineage of Saul and his dynasty. Wow. That's a pretty cool promise. But he did not keep it. So he lost that privilege, much like Esau lost his birthright to um, Jacob, his brother. Verse 14, but now your kingdom must end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. 
The Lord has already appointed him to be leader over his people, but because you have not kept the Lord's command. Samuel's cutting straight to the point. Saul, this is about the heart. The Lord rejects you because of your heart. And he selected another man who is after his own heart. These are heart issues that God is going after. Heart issues are invisible. They're inside you. No one else can see your heart. Only you know your own heart. Only you know the things that you wrestle with. And, and, and the depravity that sometimes we, we fight against uh, in our sin nature. Only we realize just the depths of that and how close we are on the brink of disaster if it wasn't for the grace of God holding us back, restraining us from practicing evil. And we see that, that uh, Saul is now rejected based on his hard attitude. So this is really important. We think it, often it's about how we look and the programs that we have and administer. Uh, you really see this in the Christian world where there's Christian leaders who are, are very successful in their, in their uh, organizations, their nonprofits or their churches. And, and, and they, they build and they construct and they expand and they get bigger. And they're very exceedingly successful in their, in their business-minded life. And they use biblical principle. And surely there's walking with God during that time. But over, over time, you see their heart really comes out. And, uh, and they drift, they drift from uh, the center who is Jehovah, who is Jesus Christ. And, and man ends up in the focus point, in the limelight, as, as the one who is the author of success. We must be very careful of pride. It's subtle as all get out. So years earlier, God had originally said through Jacob that the king would come through the tribe of Judah. But it's interesting that, that King Saul came from um, the tribe of Benjamin. So it, the Christ could have been established through the tribe of Benjamin. But, uh, but because of his attitude, the opportunity was lost. And so the kingship was indeed fulfilled through this prophecy of Genesis 49.10, where it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. That's in reference to the Messiah, the Christ. And that Messiah was prophesied to come through the line of Judah. And indeed, David comes from the line of Judah. And it was later we will see that there's a, a, a pact or a, a covenant that God makes with King David, uh, that his descendants, he will always have a descendant on the throne forever, for all of eternity, in reference once again to the Christ who is eternal and who will never die. He will live for all of eternity. Death will not have a hold over him. And therefore, as king, he will be king forever, never leaving to another descendant the kingship. So the establishment of this kingship was through the line of Judah, and that's the line that David is to come from. Okay, so let's go through Samuel chapter 15, and, and let's, see, let's go into a little bit more detail as to this heart issue that we see coming out of Saul. Um, and, and, and we see pride and, and a refusal to confess and to admit failure. And to come back and, and re repent and align his own heart with God, uh, Saul is, uh, unfortunately, uh, God has good reason to reject him. So 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm not, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. It really, really hit this guy. And he was in anguish. He just handed over the leadership to Saul. And now, now the man that was chosen by God has failed. 
here's the judge. He's the final judge. He's still alive. And he's seen how this, the decisions of the Israelites are playing out and their failures are playing out right before his eyes. And, and he's, he's deeply moved. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. The, the guy's now setting up a monument to himself. He's so prideful. Look at all my great accomplishments. Look at all my the battles that I've won, how I've brought together the people of Israel. I, man, I'm going to set up a monument to myself. Wow. First Samuel chapter 15, verse uh, 13. Now, When Samuel finally found him, Sam, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's commands. He actually genuinely thinks he's, he's, he's following God's footsteps and reflecting his character and what God wants, Unre not even realizing the depths of his mistake. Then what? What is all the bleating of sheep and goats and lowing of cattle? I hear Samuel demanded it. It's true that the army, the army spared the best of the sheep and goats and cattle, Saul admitted. The army. Doesn't that sound like uh, the, the account of Adam and Eve? Lord, it's that serpent that you gave me. It's that serpent. He's the one that deceived me. Lord, it's that woman that you gave me that deceived me. She's the one that gave me the fruit. And, and blame is passed on. Wow, we see that human tendencies uh, caused by sin present in Saul. So Saul admits then, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. All right, so the end justifies the means. Do you want to know what God thinks about that statement? The end justifies the means. God disagrees with that point. The end does not justify the means. So Saul says, I'm sacrificing these animals to God. So <laughs> uh, that's the end result. That's why we did this. You know, of course, we're going to have a big feast afterwards as well. But, but this is for God. Um, and, and that's not how it works. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Y'all recall in the stories of Saul how he hated witchcraft? He hated it so much that he, he, he tried to rid all of Israel of all, um, uh, all people practicing witchcraft and had, had them killed. There's the witch of Endor who, who, was, who feared Saul, and she very secretly practiced witchcraft. And, and so Saul hated witchcraft. And so Samuel's bringing up the point, hey, look, Saul, you hate witchcraft, but rebellion is just as bad. And stubbornness is just as bad as worshiping idols. So the, the issue here is your heart. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Let that be a strong lesson to, to us that God is pursuing our hearts, and he wants us to worship him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, with all our might. He wants all of us, our heart, not what we do, because what we do comes out of our heart. Who you are reflect, is reflected in what you do, okay? It's not what you do is reflected in who you are. It's, it's who you are is reflected in what you do. So if your heart is God's, you will reflect the heart of God in all you do. It's not about the programs. It's not about the ministry. It's not about the methodologies. It's not about your organizations, your church, your denomination. It 
is about yours and my relationship with God. And our personal, intimate responsibility between him and myself. It's, that is where this lies. That's the core issue here. Let's keep our heart in check. Let's keep one another accountable to worship God and not man, not methodologies, not organizations, not, not churches. So Yahweh is more concerned about the heart. Uh, we often think, well, you know, if I have a rebellious heart, but then I do good deeds, that God will be pleased. No, that's, God rejects that. Uh, it's so easy to say, no, I have a rebellious heart, so I have bad behavior. Of course, God's going to reject it. No, uh, th that's, that's what the world says. But you can have good behavior and God still rejects you. Why? Because your heart is far from him. You can pretend, I can pretend to be a man after God's own heart and give a, make a good show of it. But until I genuinely give my heart, the ownership of my life, the kingship of my life over to God, hand him over the reins to rule and reign over me in all of my decisions and to love him above all else, that's when I'm going to see uh, this behavior of mine transformed into his image and to glorify him in all I do and all I say and all that I am. So this first kingship was a disaster. And God tells Samuel to anoint David, the next king. So David was a shepherd boy from the tribe of Judah and the youngest of all of his brothers. And he was a good looking young man, redheaded boy. But God didn't choose him for his outward appearance, but because of his heart. Samuel, in fact, thought it was going to be Eliab, David's older brother, that was going to be king because he's such a good, strapping young man. He had all the makings of a king. But no, let's, let's read what it says. Samuel never met uh, King with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he'd ever made Saul king of Israel. But the Lord said to Samuel, um, don't judge uh, by the, his appearance. This is now in reference to Eliab or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People judge by outward appearance. This is God saying this. So God is explaining to us the obvious. You and I, we can't see each other's hearts. We don't know what goes on inside of one another. We only see the evidence and some people are professional at hiding the evidence, hiding what's in the heart. So we don't know. Only God knows the heart. And so we have to depend on God to work in people's hearts in spite of how they look. There are some people who have bad behavior, but the Lord is working hard on their hearts. And, and there's hope. So there's bad decisions that have been made and a whole series of consequences that have ensued in their life that they're reaping. But their heart, God is, is capturing, and they're, they're in this process of giving their hearts over to God, and he begins uh, molding them into his likeness, and he plans on using them in a big way. So don't give up hope as you pray for, pray for people who have had a rebellious life. It's never too late. So these are lessons in sanctification as we examine these kings of Israel, as we think of Saul. They're lessons to you and I of sanctification. And God wants to get rid of this sin in our life. He wants to, to rule over 100% of our lives, to, for us to learn to walk by faith and, and trusting him and obeying him in every aspect. That's what he pursues, to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. And we'll see that played out in loving one another as we love ourselves. So we see that only God can provide real security. These are just a couple of observations as we close this lesson. 
God can, only God can provide real security and assurance. Do you fear something? Do you fear the stock market? Do you fear the, the health healthcare system? Do you fear the direction our country's headed? The laws that are being passed? Is there constant fear? Fear of accidents on the roadway? Fear of COVID? Fear of, uh, of, of diseases? Yes, these are things that often will strike fear into our hearts. But don't let fear control you because God is, is infinite. He is, he is, there is all loving. He is all knowing. He is all powerful and all holy. We in turn are finite in every aspect, limited in love. We're incomplete and perfect. We're, we're incomplete in knowledge and understanding. We're limited in our ability. Our conscience has to be tied to the creator God for it to be, uh, to make proper decisions. Let's, let's trust God. Uh, let's not be like Israel and say, no, we want a king. Make Christ king of your life. Let's make him king, not a pastor, not a church, not a, a, a political leader or an organizational leader or our spouse, or our children. May the Lord reign sovereign in our hearts every day, every moment of our lives. The blessing that comes from that is tremendous. So though, but let this be an encouragement because though Israel rejected God by asking for a king, God remained faithful to him assured them he assured them of his promises and again invited them to to be obedient to him he didn't just wipe them off and say oh i'm done with you guys they remained his children his people to bring about his purposes and glory so even though you and i yes we're constantly making bad decisions his grace is sufficient as he is unlimited in grace and mercy and kindness and goodness and he, for his own name's sake, will rescue us from ourselves, even. Was God unnecessarily harsh with Saul? Well, he doesn't seem like he was as bad as some of the other kings that uh, we'll look at in, in the future. Uh, it says, as the king Ahab, uh, so were some of these other kings. And so Ahab was a horrible king, introducing uh, idolatry to Baal. And so we, we don't see Saul that bad. If we want to compare kings to kings, it's like, oh, Saul wasn't that bad. But what is the core issue here? Saul rejected God as his king. And, and that's what God can't stand. God does not accept that. He is the king of king and lord of lords. And if, if, if his will is going to be accomplished through you and me, through Saul, then we have to submit our authority to him so that he and his word becomes final authority in our lives. The final authority, the one who really wins. So God had to confront Saul. So he's an example of someone who chose to live a life independently without God, not consulting him, not asking him, God, what do you think? Is this is, is my decision that I'm wanting to do going to reflect your glory? Is it going to bring you uh, fame? And, and, and is my testimony for you going to reflect your goodness and your kindness? Or, or is my testimony going to actually create this opposite effect where people blaspheme you and say, yep, uh, I knew Christians were a bunch of freaks. Yeah. Certainly don't want to follow Jesus if that's what following Jesus looks like. So we don't want others to blaspheme God's name because of us. But let's follow him in dependence upon him with all of our heart. So pride, yes, God addressed pride uh, in Saul's heart. He may not have been as bad as some of the other ones, but he had to address them. He addressed his attitude. He addressed his independence, um, his uh, superficial obedience. Let's strive for a genuine and authentic uh, obedience to God. Let's heed the words of the prophet Samuel, obey 
is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than the offering, the fat of rams. Let's stop there today.